Please stand for the reading of God's word. This passage is out of the book of Acts, chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. You may be seated. Good morning. Just want to highlight next week uh, during the service and for the member meeting, we're going to be focusing on what the church is going to be in the coming years and kind of the wonderful problems we have in front of us to solve. That includes, I mean, we are changing our name, which is going to take place probably in the next month or two. And that's given us an opportunity to kind of think about the vision and mission of the church. And so we'll be talking about mission and vision and values and elders and deacons and land and building and I don't, maybe some other stuff. Uh, there's a couple things going on here. I also want to say thank you to Blaine and Carol who are around here somewhere. And I'm not going to make you stand up or anything. At least you better be in here. Okay, there you are. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for serving on staff. Uh, you're in great encouragement to many of us. Uh, me included, and I'm grateful to be your neighbor, and I'm grateful you're staying in the church. Uh, so you're not done serving, you're just done being on staff. And Carol's been a great blessing to me personally, uh, protecting my schedule and telling me what's up, and uh, picking up all the stuff my kids leave in my office. And really, it's my stuff, but I blame my children, <laughs> like most parents. And uh, last, let me say welcome back, Becky Lockie. I see you over there. Um, thank you, parents, for bringing her back to us. Uh, at our last member meeting, what did Becky say to me? Someone said, so Darren, what are you going to do now that there's an executive pastor? And Becky answered the question saying, maybe he'll spend time with his kids now. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. <laughs> uh, so welcome back. Let's pray. Father, we now turn to your word and we say, speak to us. Speak, O Lord, these words handed down to us over time, carefully taken care of for us, copied by many, many unknown people so that we can have this book. We have more at our disposal right now in our hands than all of Christians throughout all of history until recently. We have more in our hands than even most Christians in the world today. We have your book. And so speak in Jesus' name, amen. And a friend serving among Muslims in the middle of nowhere doing medical work, and a Muslim woman came in with her child. Uh, the child was badly burned, and so she started to care for this uh, child, and she turned to the mother and said, I'm doing this in the name of Jesus because Jesus loves you. And she began to explain a little bit about what she meant. And the Muslim woman said to her, oh, that's who he is. I've been waiting for you. The Muslim, grew up, uh, Muslim woman grew up in folk Islam, and her husband had sold her to the local witch doctor as payment. Not sold her, but given to the witch doctor as payment because he needed the witch doctor to put a curse on his neighbor uh, for planting in his fields. And the curse work, the, the son the, of the neighbor dropped dead, and so she was given to a man 30 years older than her. And a few days after her wedding, a man in white appeared to her in the middle of the night and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And she said, he showed me scars on his hands and feet, he told me he was God, and he told me that one day someone would come and tell me who, what his name was. I've been waiting for you patiently. An entire Kurdish family had a dream one night. The dream was, go across the river to receive living water. 
They all went the next day and found Christians handing out Bibles. A man came to a ministry center at 6 a.m. to find an Iranian Muslim there. They didn't speak any Farsi, so he said, why don't you come back? And so he stayed until noon, six hours. At noon, the Iranian pastor joined them, said, hey, how can I help you? He said, a man in white came last night in my dream and said, follow me. And I asked him who he was, and he said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. No one comes to the Father but through me. He, and I want to know, what does this dream mean? And so the pastor says, have you ever seen this book? No, what is it? It's a Bible. Have you ever read this book? No. Interesting. Let me read you some passages. I am the Alpha and the Omega. No one comes to the Father but through me. The man converts. And so they're going to give him a Bible. Say, well, would you like one of these? And he said, yes. He said, well, the Muslims will give you a hard time in the camp. He said, the God of my dreams is more powerful than the Muslims in the refugee camps. Give me that Bible. Well, do you want any food? No, I'm good. And he left. An hour later, he's back with 10 more Muslims. Hey, I told these guys about the dream I had and what you said, and they want Bibles too. January 12th, 2019, just another day of pain for me. Four years, my body has betrayed me. Unexplained headaches, numbness, a broken metabolism, two-hour naps every afternoon, and digestive problems so severe I couldn't stand up and speak for longer than 20 minutes. I was altering travel plans. I was not coaching youth sports. Resist the urge to play armchair doctor. I had been to doctors. I had tried stuff. And I was preaching. And I hadn't preached in 12 months because I had almost collapsed. And there I was in Texas, that interesting state of Texas, visiting a small group. I was about to preach the next morning. I had canceled my meetings the day, before, the, the, the day of. That morning, I had been in so much pain, I had just walked away from breakfast. And I told them, and I was nervous. And they said, let's pray. And they put hands on me, and they prayed. I went, prayed, made it through, I preached the next morning. A week later, I noticed something. No pain, no hurt, no naps. Had I changed my diet? Nope. Had I changed my routine? Nope. Had the stress level changed? Absolutely not. God had healed me with no fanfare. What are we supposed to make of stories like that? What are we supposed to make about the miraculous? And how does that fit into God's plan? Now, if you find yourself a skeptic today, I'm not here to try to convince you that miracles happen. This is not an apologetic about uh, miracles in the world today. I honestly find that the arguments against miracles always get outlasted by the fact that miracles keep happening. And so those arguments, I mean, one of the ways that you can kind of overcome those arguments is meeting people that have had those happen to them firsthand. So let's turn to Acts. Remember where we are. I'll just summarize. Jesus has died. He's resurrected 40 days. He's meeting with his disciples, tells them to go back to Jerusalem, back to Jerusalem. They go, they wait, they pray. It's Pentecost. Boom, Holy Spirit comes down. They start speaking in other languages, tongues of fire on their head. A couple thousand people trust Jesus as the Messiah. They all get baptized. Peter preaches this long sermon. No one seems to care. All the Old Testament promises are now fulfilled. Acts 3, here comes a, uh, a healing of, of someone who's been, who's been crippled from birth. He gets healed. Long, long healing. Peter uses then this whole event to preach again. You killed him. You crucified him. I can't believe you did this. You, you, you. Calm down, Peter. Peter and John are, are preaching. The, the religious leaders go, this is a problem. So they arrest him. You need to stop. We're not stopping. You need to stop. We're not stopping. What are we going to do? We have to let them go. We're scared of the people. They let them go. They go to a prayer service. At the prayer service. They ask the, ask the Lord, stretch out your hand with signs and wonders. And the whole building goes. Bloop. All of a sudden, all the wallets are converted. I mean, that's a sign and wonder of itself. Like people's, like money are just kind of, I'm selling land for you and I'm selling land for you. And you get money and you get money, just passing out money. And then there's this guy, Barnabas, who's the example of this. And then there's the anti-Barnabas, Ananias and Sapphira, who, who has their lives taken away from them because they lied. They tried to gain a reputation 
on the backs of the poor Christians by pretending to be generous. And so now we come to another one of the summary statements. There's one in Acts 2, there's one in Acts 4, and now we have one in Acts 5. And here are all the believers meeting in Solomon's colonnade. Now that's at the temple on the eastern side. There's columns along, there's a wood roof on top. It's one of the one places where the believers can meet because it's large enough. And the Christians hadn't been kicked out of the temple yet. They hadn't been kind of persecuted out into the diaspora, into other cities. And so here they are, they're meeting, and the apostles are performing signs and wonders, and it's so powerful that people are saying, if only I could get into Peter's shadow, maybe I would be healed, and everyone is healed. Now this seems like a perfect text then to talk about signs and wonders and miracles in general. Now, we have a lot of backgrounds here. Some of you have like zero Christian backgrounds. Some of you have different religious backgrounds. Some of you are Roman Catholic. Some of you are, uh, you know, Christian Reformed background. You've, you've just, you guys are from everywhere. We're just like religious mutts in this evangelical free church. You know, vineyard, Pentecostal, assemblies of God. People get nervous. What is Darren going to say about signs and wonders? But this isn't just some sort of cute debate that kind of is kind of inter-Christian debate. This is pretty serious stuff because this is about what is the Christian life like and what can we expect from God? Like, what should we be praying for? What should we expect him to do? And then if he doesn't do it, what does that mean? And so I'm just going to ask questions. And these questions will hopefully kind of guide you. This isn't a sermon about why you're right and I'm wrong. This is about, I mean, I think I'm right, or I wouldn't say what I'm about to say. It's just look down at the text, try to figure out what can I expect from God to do, and can I ask him to do things like this? So questions are this. Why did they pray for this? Question two, what is a sign and wonder? Question three, what are the warnings about signs and wonders? Question four, how did the people respond? And I'll repeat these. And then five, should we pray for this? Okay, why did they pray for this? Now, this is the answer to prayer in Acts 4. I'll read the end of Acts 4. This is verse 30. Stretch out your hand, Lord, to heal and to perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So they're praying for Acts 5, Acts 5 here to happen. They want it to happen. It might seem strange to pray for this. I, I was like, why, why would you pray for this? I mean, these people have seen the greatest sign and wonder of all time. Jesus Christ resurrected. Why do they need more? Like, some of these people knew him. They were with him for three years. And they're saying, Lord, stretch out your hands and do signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now, I think it's twofold. One, it's essentially saying, show people you're on our side. And two, so that more people can come in. So show people that what we're saying is legit, you know, do stuff. And two, so that more people can come in. And I'll, I'll just point this out as we, as we go through. So that's question one. Two, what is a sign and wonder? A sign and wonder is like a technical theological term for major events in Scripture. You get these in the Old Testament, you get these here in the New Testament. This is history-altering events. These are almost always, not always, but I'll just go almost always miraculous. A sign points to something that needs to be worshipped, so it's pointing away from itself. And the wonder is what happens that inspires the worship within us. Signs and wonders, pointing away, inspiring worship. So in the Old Testament, for example, in the book of Exodus, God performs signs and wonders. This is most of the place in the Old Testament where this phrase happens. The plagues, the pillar of fire. And some of you are like, I've never read about this, but I've seen Prince of Egypt, the movie. So you kind of get it, right? Like manna from heaven. The psalmist will say this. God sent his signs and wonders into your midst, O Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his servants. That's Psalm 135.9. In Acts 7, Stephen stands up to preach, says the exact same thing. He led out of Egypt and did signs and or wonders and miraculous signs. These signs and wonders were judgments against Egypt for the deliverance of God's people. That's just interesting because at the end of Deuteronomy, it actually flips 
God actually threatens judgment on his people as a sign and wonder. Some of those signs then begin to ask people to question God. You may know the, the, the most well-known one is they've got, they're in the wilderness, there's no food. God says, I got a solution. Poof, out of the sky, manna. And at first they go great. And then as soon as they go great, they go, well, actually we want more. And then they go, why did you bring us out here? And now it just kind of, it's like an addict, right? Like you start on something small, you do it for a while, but then it doesn't like do it for you. So what do you have to do? More. And then what do you have to do? More. What do you have to do? More, more, more. And that's what kind of the attitude here. Like, you know, Lord, that, that's cool and all, but actually to show that you love me, you can't just do that. You got to do more of that. That's quite an attitude. The psalmists and the prophets then look back in that event and they go, things like Psalm 78, in spite of his wonders, they did not believe. They did not believe in spite of the wonders. Signs and wonders are miracles. Things that are outside of nor the normal bounds of life. And the purpose of these miracles are to point them beyond the miracle to something else that is worship, some power, God's saving act. I mean, this is the Gospel of John. So the Gospel of John is the fourth gospel. What is the reason for the Gospel of John? Guess what? He tells us at the end. This is the last verses of the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Jesus did other miraculous, here's the word, signs. In the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. So Jesus walking on water, Lazarus raised from the dead, the feeding of lunch to 5,000 people, the turning of water into wine are all meant for one thing. So that when you read it, you can believe you can believe. Then we have in the book of Acts, this is Peter, Acts chapter 2. Jesus of Nazareth is a man accredited by God to you through miracles, wonders, and, guess the word, signs. These signs then command faith. They're, they're demanding something. They're saying, this is true. But it goes further. It, didn't, it doesn't just authenticate Jesus. It authenticates the messenger's that are telling about Jesus. That's why signs and wonders, and this is kind of important as you kind of put this together in real life, are only done by the apostles. Think about that. Acts 2, only done by the apostles. Acts 5 here, done by the apostles. Paul and Barnabas, Acts 14 and 15, done by the apostles. Other than that, there's only two people who perform signs and wonders in the book of Acts, Stephen and Philip. That's it. There seems to be some kind of limiting factor. And why is that important? Because God, in performing these signs and wonders, are authenticating the messenger. For example, I'll just read you one. This is Acts chapter 14, verse 3. There it is. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there. They're in a city. Speaking boldly for the Lord, and here it is, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. Authentication. These guys are from me, and I'm going to have them perform signs and wonders so you know it. That's important. These signs and wonders are part of major redemptive events. So you've got the Exodus, you have the resurrection of Jesus, and you have all these things going on around those two events. Now, the signs and wonders back in Acts 4 are, are two things, healing and exorcism. Just look at verse 15 for a second. As a result, so it says they perform signs and wonders, and so we kind of have a feeling for what they're doing because of this. People brought the sick into the streets, laid them on their beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on them as he passed by. I mean, think about the power there. They're, they're like, man, this is so crazy. If we can just get close enough. Crowds gathered also from around the towns, around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Wow. Some of them? No. Every single person. Now, we'll talk about exorcism later, 
But let's talk about healing. Now, there are some limits to this, especially in the healing of our text here. And there are warnings I'll talk about later. But let's just say positively, there is a lot of healing going on in the Gospels and in Acts. Acts 3, there's, there's just been a huge one. And in 17 times in the book of Acts, there's a miracle, and that leads to a person coming to faith in Jesus. 17 times. For example, this is from Acts 9. Peter traveled to the country. He went to visit the Lord's people in Lydda. And there he found a man, Aeneas, who was paralyzed and been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, he said, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and walk and roll up your mat. Immediately he got up. All who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. See what's happening? Miracle, belief, signpost. And the story after that is Peter raising some girl from the dead. And again, what happened? Miracle, belief. And I've seen that, right? Like God answers a prayer that is pretty miraculous. God does something that is pretty miraculous. And people believe. But there are limits. This doesn't happen all the time. This doesn't happen to everyone. And everyone in all of these stories is dead. Lazarus, I think Lazarus had the bum deal of everybody. He dies, that sucks, you know, but like you go to heaven and you get brought back. Who wants that? Same with Eutychus, falls off a window ledge, brought back. Healing in the scriptures are often limited. Jesus heals a withered hand. Jesus heals a, a, a fever. Jesus heals leprosy. Sometimes those are demonic afflictions, yes, but there's no indication that they are total healing. Just for me, my body was restored. Absolutely miraculous event, but I've had the flu this year. I've had COVID this year. I've been tired this year. I've had a bad reaction to food this year. I've been grumpy this year because my body's hurt. But I was healed in a moment, but not of everything. It's better my sins are forgiven then I was healed. There's a theological word for it, and the word is providence. God's kind of guiding of the world. I mean, the announcement of the Savior of Jesus, that Jesus was coming in the flesh, also led to the slaughter of children. Lazarus still died. Surely Jesus passed other funerals, right? Like, why just him? Why not everybody? Certainly, there are more blind people than the ones he healed. Stephen gets stoned. I mean, even in chapter 5, the angel comes to Peter, gets him out of jail, which is next week. I'm going to steal my sermon next week, whatever. The angel comes, gets Peter out of jail, but he doesn't spare him from being flogged 39 times. It's like, Lord, if you can send an angel to get him out of jail, can't you prevent the flogging? Even Paul, who performs signs and wonders himself, tells Timothy, hey, take some wine for that stomach ailment. He tells the Galatians in chapter 4, verse 13, a sickness is what brought me here to share the gospel with you. He had malaria, most likely. Paul, the one who performs signs and wonders, couldn't heal himself. He couldn't turn to Barnabas and say, hey, man, I got malaria. Can you take care of it for me? The Bible is not simplistic. It doesn't tell us why some people are healed and some are not. I think about this for myself all the time. Some of the godliest people I know have been sick while I was healed. I don't know why. The mysteries are a mystery. But I understand the pull of some teaching that says if you are just strong enough in your faith, you can pick yourself up out of that cancer diagnosis. No, you can't. God is doing other things. In 1984, David Watson, who was an uh, Anglican leader, went out to visit his friend John Wimber, who was the founder of the um, Vineyard Movement. And he went out for an intense time of prayer and healing. And this is what he wrote. My asthma has persisted. I slept so badly last night, my legs and ankles and feet blew up. My abdomen grew at such an astonishing rate, I look like a pregnant woman. My arms and shoulders have withered. However, God is still active. At 1 a.m., I had a bad asthma attack and helplessness. I cried out to God. I'm not very good at listening to God, but between 1 and 3, God spoke to me so powerfully. 
He showed me that all my preaching, writing, and other ministry was nothing compared to my relationship to him. God also showed me my love for him meant nothing unless, that I, unless I was able to love my brothers and sisters in Christ. And the Lord put various names on my mind, and I began writing letters to all 12 people, asking for forgiveness for hurting them. Whatever else happens to me physically, God is working. His challenge to me is summed up this way, seek my face. Those are the last words he ever wrote. He died, like every single person who's ever been healed. What are the warnings, the signs and wonders? So why did they pray? So people would know the Lord, so they would be confirmed. What's a sign and wonder? Something pointing to something, a power to be worshipped, to create worship within us. Okay, what are the warnings? I'm going to give you four warnings about signs and wonders. First, signs and wonders are actually performed outside of the biblical God. The Egyptian magicians matched Moses miracle for miracle. They had power too. There are miracles that happen in other religions. No problem. For whatever reason, God allows that power to exist. 2 Thessalonians 2, the servant of Satan, performs signs and wonders. Revelation 13, the beast, just whatever that means, just let it go. Just some, it means something. It means a servant of Satan. And what does that beast do? It performs great and miraculous signs. The point is, there is power outside of the biblical God somewhere that allows others to perform signs and wonders. So you can't say, just because it's power means it's from God. Number two, false prophets within the believing community can do signs and wonders. Deuteronomy 13 tells you, if a prophet who foretells by dreams, appears among you, and announces a miraculous sign and wonder. And if that sign and wonder takes place, and then he says, let us follow other gods and let us worship them, you must not listen to the word of that prophet. Think about that. The text isn't saying in Deuteronomy 13, that sign isn't real. They're saying that message is wrong. That's it. So in this case, the miracle is real. It's happening within the community of faith. But look, if people aren't drawn to Jesus, it's not legit. Jesus warns people pretty significantly. You may know this passage. He says, people will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, will, will, enter the, will not enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, depart from me, I never knew you. Brutal. What do you mean? I don't know you, Lord. I perform miracles. I, I cast out a demon in your name. And Jesus says back to them, I have no idea who you are. Walk away. They're using the sign and wonder to be what is central. The reason, Lord, you have to let me into your kingdom is because I did this stuff. That's pretty heavy, right? That's within the community of faith. All right, third warning. Jesus condemns people for asking for signs. That's pretty tough. I mean, that's kind of weird because in Acts 4, they ask for it. And so, uh, you know, you think about that. Jesus says... Uh, warns people not to ask for a sign in multiple places. And then in Acts 4, here they are asking for a sign. And then in Acts 5, the prayer actually gets answered. What's going on? Here's the tension. Matthew 12, Jesus says these words. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said, Teacher, we want, you to, see, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah brutal, right? Acts 16, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus, and there's that word, tested him, and asking him to show them a sign from heaven. And he replied, when evening comes, you say, it'll be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, you say, today's going to be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you can't interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and walked away. Why is he so harsh? In Matthew 12, Jesus has just cast out a demon. 
The religious leaders then attack him. They don't say he didn't do it. He said, by what power do you do that? Jesus did the miracle. And essentially, they're now saying to him, hey, show us something. Show us something. Acts 15. So this is right before that Matthew 16 passage. Jesus has just fed 4,000 people. And if it's chronological, they're still eating. And the Pharisees and Sadducees see it. And they go, show us something. I mean, give me a break. I have a 12-year-old kid in my life named Eli Jordan. Eli is awesome. He calls me little boss, and I call him big boss, even though I'm his dad's boss <laughs> and a close friend of his dad's. Every time I walk in the house, he says this to me, show me the trick. Show me the trick. Show me the trick. It's a card trick. He can't figure it out. I've done it like 200 times. It's all he cares about. <laughs> this is the attitude of the Pharisees and these people. Show me something. Show me. Show me. Show me something. Prove it. Prove it. Prove it. I just speak to the Christian and the non-Christian, the skeptic all together here. God has given us this book. <laughs> and, and this is enough. That's what John 20 is about. I have written all these miracles down so that you can believe. Now, I didn't mean to trick you here at the very beginning of the sermon by front-loading those stories, but let's be for real. Will you remember the stories I shared or Jesus Christ? Are those stories more miraculous to you than the ones you've read? Do you go, wow, to these stories or only ones that are outside of the Bible? I'm not trying to trick you, but that's what John is about. Is the sign of Jonah enough? I mean, you'd be amazed. This is kind of mercy. The sign of Jonah is the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's kind of a big sign. I don't know, central to the Christian faith. That sign is enough to believe. You don't need another sign. I mean, even during the Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church attacked Luther and Calvin. And one of their attacks was, you have no miracles. You're not legitimate. To which Calvin said, In demanding miracles, you're acting dishonestly, for we have not coined some new gospel, but retain the truth, which is confirmed by all the miracles which Christ and the apostles ever wrought. This is enough. This is the wow. This is the wow. This is what's amazing. The story of Lazarus is crazy. That's warning three. Last warning. The hyperemphasis on the miraculous is generally not a sign of spiritual health. If you read, for example, in the letter to the Corinthians, there's three entire chapters dedicated to kind of miraculous gifts, in particular prophecy and healing and tongues. And we'll, we'll get there eventually in the book of Acts. But in the middle of that is the love chapter, right? And we, that's the typical chapter you read at a wedding. In, in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but here's the... Th not Yeah, 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 it's the Bible. It's great. But listen, <laughs> listen. That chapter is not about marriage. That chapter is an argument against spiritual gifts being central. If I speak in the tongues of angels and men and have not love, I'm a resounding gong. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge, and I have faith that can move mountains but don't have love, I am nothing. Love never fails. Where prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they'll be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. I just want you to grapple with that. The Corinthians are super, super focused on the miraculous. Paul even tells them, pursue it all the more, even though it's broken. But he says the litmus test of this whole thing is not miracles, but whether you love one another. That's it. Which leads me to this truth. This is the principle. The miracles and the ministry of Jesus and the early church are not the point. I was walking with my friend Javad once. Iranian pastor, and I was pressing him on this story, miraculous story. It's a crazy story. Miracle. Amazing. And he just turned to me and said, I'm sorry, I forgot. So many of these happen all the time. I just can't remember it all. Miracles have their place, but they're subordinated to something else. The gospel. 
Jesus Christ, him crucified. That's the wow. That's the amazing. And so even for myself, I, I have all these stories, and I feel like sometimes I should withhold them because those are the only wow factors for Christians. Amazing, great, moving, powerful. Why are they more powerful than this? I mean, for real. And the same is true with the apostles. You know, Jesus doesn't walk around doing a healing ministry. In fact, if you read the Gospels, you find that every, almost everyone comes at their initiative, not Jesus's. And when Jesus does initiate, it's to show why he's there in the first place. He actually limits miracles and limits healings. And when the crowds get big, he leaves. Too much. His whole emphasis is, I came to preach and teach. I came for the kingdom of God. They're looking for sign. I'm not giving it to you. The apostles do the same thing. The early church does the whole th same thing. This whole movement of like healing ministries, completely foreign to the Bible. You know, as a church, we shouldn't be moved. By, we could be moved by a miracle. We should be crying our eyes out when some hard-nosed kid comes to faith in Christ and comes up here to be baptized and says, your prayers got me here. That's when we all cry. That's when we're all moved. God is still at work nonetheless. And pastorally, I'll just mention that the abuse of these gifts, of which there is a lot, and you may have been in a church, does not really mean much to me in terms of the fact that they don't exist. Even the Corinthians who are hyper-spiritual, Paul tells them, he doubles down on them, rebukes them a lot, and then goes, and pursue them. What do you, pursue them? Paul, dial them back. Ten notches. They're out of control. Nope, keep going. We gotta be careful not to be hypercritical when stuff like this happens. They, people who have this happen to them, they might not know what's happening to them. They might not be able to explain it correctly. They may not have the right words. They may even be saying things that are off, and you're like, hey, maybe it's actually like this. I, mean, I, I couldn't find this quote, but I remember reading a pastor from New York City, Tim Keller, saying one of, the, one of the marks of revival and kind of miraculous happening is that the conservatives come and nitpick and criticize. That's true of the American church when the first great revivals broke out. All the conservatives came, can't be real, can't be real, has to be this, has to be this detail exactly. Why? Why does it all have to line up? Can't it just let it happen? God's still at work. Question four, how do the people respond? It's kind of varied. This is a wild verse. So, no one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded. Nevertheless, more and more people believed. I mean, sometimes you go, what are, what's a contradiction in the Bible? What? No one else joined them. Nevertheless, more and more believed. So some people were frightened and some people were drawn. Now that's an interesting combo, right? Like some people see that and go, scary stuff. And some people see that and go, give me more. Some people say, I'm not joining that group. Some people say, I need to get into Peter's shadow. I mean, this is the group that just saw Ananias and Sapphira, boom, dead, buried. Would you want to join that group? <laughs> that's the same group that's now healing people left and right. So the responses are varied. It's not the golden ticket for evangelism. Yes, some people believe, some people don't. You know, I have someone close to me whose mom was healed miraculously. She was in bed for a year, and they had two women come and pray for her after this year. De the, the Mayo Clinic sent the death certificate to the house, and they essentially said uh, her name, I won't say her name, you know, Dorothy, I just make it up, get up and walk, and she did. And her two sons were there, and they're now uh, much older, and 70s. And the one brother believed and became a pastor, and the other brother is not a Christian and does not remember the event at all. It's not some golden ticket. Some people are scared. Some people believe. It's varied. So, at the end, should we pray for this? 
Think of Paul's words. Jews demand a sign and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. It's 1 Corinthians. Here is Paul, who's performed signs and wonders and goes to the Corinthians and say, I don't want you to know that at all. I want you to know Jesus, and that's it. Now, he's not demeaning the prayer of Acts 4. I mean, if he's saying we can't pray for this, then Acts 4 prayer is bad, and Acts 5 fulfillment is not good. That can't be the case. But there is something about it has to be about Jesus. And the second test, I think, is that you should be able to see fruit of the Spirit. Is the person being exalted or is God being exalted? Think about the miraculous ministries out there. Who gets exalted in those ministries? The person and their wallet or God? You know the answer to that. Does it bring unity in the church? Do people follow Jesus Christ? I mean, if you just ask those two things, does it about Jesus the Messiah and does the fruit of the Spirit come out of this, you can pretty much eliminate all the junk and get down to what's really happening. So why did they pray? To confirm the message and to have people come to faith in Jesus. What is the sign and wonder? Miraculous events calling us to worship. What are the warnings? There are many. Essentially, they're not central. How did the people respond? Varied. And should we pray this? Yes. For the sake of the gospel. Lord, stretch out your hand in Bozeman. Perform miracles in Bozeman. Not for our sake, but for your sake. So that people would be drawn in to know Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, you perform healing on people who will eventually die. You draw people to your son, Jesus Christ, who will have eternal life. It is better that our sins are forgiven than that we're healed. We ask you to work in miraculous ways amongst us, that we would have a wow factor on anyone who would come to know you and treasure you. We would have a wow factor on reading the stories in scripture and that we wouldn't need stories far away or even present to give us the wow factor. You've given us your book. In Jesus' name, amen.